I'll accompany here. You are best to call them generally, man by man, according to the script. Here is the scroll of every man's name, which is thought fit through all Athens, to play in our interlude before the Duke and Duchess on his wedding day at night. First, good Peter Quince, say what the play treats on, then read the names of the actors, and so grow to a point. Mary, our play is the most lamentable comedy and the most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. A very good piece of work, I assure you, and a Mary. Now, good Peter Quince, Call forth your actors by the scroll. Masters, spread yourselves. Answer as I call you, Nick Bottom, the weaver. Ready. Name what part I am for and proceed. You, Nick Bottom, are set down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus? A lover or a tyrant? A lover that kills himself most gallant for love. That will ask some tears in the true performing of it. If I do it, let the audience look to their eyes. I will move storms, I will condole in some measure to the rest. Yet my chief humor is for a tyrant. I could play Ericles rarely, or a part to tear a cat in to make all split. The raging rocks and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates. Amphibious' car shall find from afar and make him mar the foolish fates. This was lofty. Now name the rest of the players. This is Ericles' vein, a tyrant's vein, a lover's more condoling. Francis Flute, the bellows mander. Here, Peter Quince. Flute, you must take Thisbe on you. What is Thisbe? A wandering knight? It is the lady that Pyramus must love. Nay, Faith, let me not play a woman. I have a beard. Coming. That's all one. You shall play it in a mask, and you may speak as small as you will. And I might have my face. Let me play Thisbe too. I'll speak in a monstrous little voice. Thisbe. Thisbe, our peer, Miss Lover, dear, and our Thisbe, dear, and Lady, dear. No, no. You must play Pyramus and flute you Thisbe. Well, proceed. Robin Starveling, the tailor. Here, Peer Quince. Robin Starveling, you must play Thisbe's mother. Tom Snap, the tinker. Here, Peter Quince. You, Pyramus' father. Myself, Thisbe's father. Snug, the joiner. You, the lion's part. And I hope here is a play fitted. Have you the lion's part written? Pray you, if it be, give it to me, for I am slow of study. You may do it extempore, for it is nothing but roaring. Let me play the lion, too. I will roar. That I will do any man's heart good to hear me. I will roar. That I will make the duke say again, Let him roar again! Let him roar again! And you should do it too terribly. You would fright the Duchess and the ladies, and they would shriek, and that were enough to hang us all. That would hang us. Every mother's son. I, I grant you, friends. If that you should fright the ladies out of their wits, they would have no more discretion but to hang us. But I will aggravate my voice so that I will roar as gently as any sucking dove. I will roar you and twer any nightingale. You can play no pop but Pyramus. Well, Pyramus is a sweet-faced man, a proper man, as one shall see in a summer's day, a most lovely gentleman-like man. Therefore, you must needs play Pyramus. Well, I will undertake it. What beard were I best to play it in? Why, what you will. I will just charge it in either your straw-colored beard, your orange tawny beard, your purple and grain beard, or your French crown color beard, your perfect yellow. Some of your French crowns have no hair at all, and then you will play barefaced. But masters, here are your parts, and I am to entreat you, request you, and desire you to con them by tomorrow night and meet me in the palace wood, a mile without the town, by moonlight. There we will rehearse, for if we meet in the city, we shall be dogged with company, and our devices known. In the meantime, I will draw a bill of properties, such as our play wants. I pray you, fail me not. We will meet, and there we may rehearse to most obscenely and courageously. Take pains! <laughs> Be perfect. Adieu. At the Duke's Oak we meet. How now, spirit? Whither wander you? Over hill, over dale, through a bush, through a briar, over park, over pale, through a flood, through a fire. 
I do wander everywhere, swifter than the moon's sphere. And I serve the fairy queen to do her orbs upon the green. The cowslips tall her pensioners be in their gold coats, spots you see. Those be rubies, fairy favors. In those freckles live their savers. I must go seek some dewdrops here and hang a pearl in every cowslip's ear. Farewell, thou lob of spirits, I'll be gone. Our queen and her elves come here anon. The king doth keep his rebels here tonight. Take heed, the queen, come not within his sight. For Oberon is passing fell and wrath, because that she, as her attendant hath, a lovely boy, stolen from an Indian king. She never had so sweet a changeling. And jealous Oberon would have the child, knight of his train, to trace the forest wild. But she perforce withholds the loved boy, crowns him with flowers, and makes him all her joy. And now they never meet in the grove or green, by fountain clear or spangled starlight sheen. But they do square that all their elves for fear creep into acorn cups and hide them there. Either I mistake your shape and making quite, or else you are that shrewd and knavish sprite called Robin Goodfellow. Are not you he that frights the maidens of the villagery, skim milk, and sometimes labor in the quern, and bootless make the breathless housewife turn, and sometime make the drink to bear no barm, mislead night wanderers, laughing at their harm? Those that hobgoblin call you and sweet puck, you do their work, and they shall have good luck. Are not you he? Thou speakest aright. <laughs> I am the merry wanderer of the night. I jest to Oberon and make him smile when I, a fat and bean-fed horse beguile, neighing in likeness of a filly foal. And sometime lurk I in a gossip's bowl, in very likeness of a roasted crab when she drinks. Against her lips I bob, and on her withered dewlap pour the ale, the wisest aunt telling the saddest tale. Sometime for three-foot stool mistaketh me. Then I slip from her bum, and down topples she, and Taylor cries and falls into a cough. And then the whole choir holds their hips and laugh and waxen in their mirth and knees and swear a merrier hour was never wasted there. But, but room fairy, here comes Oberon. And here, my mistress, would that he were gone. I'll believe it just like that. Ill met by moonlight, proud Titania. What jealous Oberon? Fairies, skip hence, I have forsworn his bed and company. Terry, rash wanton, am I not thy lord? Then I must be thy lady. These are the forgeries of jealousy, and never, since the middle summer spring, met we on hill, in dale, forest, or mead, by paved mountain, or by rushy brook, or in the beached margin of the sea, to dance our ringlets to the whistling wind. But with thy brawls thou hast disturbed our sport, Therefore, the moon, the governess of floods, pale in her hanger, washes all the air, that rheumatic diseases do abound. And thorough this distemperature we see the seasons alter. Hoary-headed frost, far in the fresh lap of the crimson rose, and on old hem's thin and icy crown, an odorous chaplet of sweet summer buds is as in mockery set. The spring, the summer, the childing autumn, angry winters change their wonted liveries. And the amazed world, by their increase knows not which is which, and the same progeny of evil comes from our debates, from our dissension. We are the parents and original. Do you amend it then? It lies in you. Why should Titania cross her Oberon? I do but beg a little changeling boy to be my henchman. Set your heart at rest. The fairy land buys not the child of me. His mother was a votress of my order, and in the spiced Indian air by night, Full often hath she gossiped by my side. But she, being mortal of that boy, did die. And for her sake, I do rear up her boy. And for her sake, I will not part with him. How long within this wood intend you stay? Perchance till after Theseus's wedding day. If you will patiently dance in our round and see our moonlight revels, go with us. If not, shun me, and I will spare your haunts. Give me that boy, and I'll go with thee. Not for thy fairy kingdom. Fairies away, we shall shy downright, if I longer stay. Well, go thy way. Thou shalt not from this grove till I torment thee for this injury. 
My gentle pot, come hither. Thou rememberest, since once I sat upon a promontory and heard a mermaid on a dolphin's back uttering such dulcet and harmonious breath that the rude sea grew civil at her song and certain stars shot madly from their spheres to hear the sea maid's music. I remember. That very time I saw, but thou couldst not, flying between the cold moon and the earth, Cupid all armed. A certain aim he took at a fair vestal, throned by the west, and loosed his love shaft smartly from his bow. Yet marked I where the bolt of Cupid fell. It fell upon a little western flower, before milk white, now purple with the love's wound, and maidens call it love in idleness. Fetch me that flower. The herb I shewed thee once, the juice of it on sleeping eyelids laid will make or man or woman madly dote upon the next live creature that it sees. Fetch me the herb, and be thou here again, ere the leviathan can swim a league. I'll put a girdle round about the earth in a forty minutes. Having once this juice, I'll watch Titania when she is asleep, and drop the liquor of it in her eyes. The next thing then she waking looks upon, she shall pursue it with the soul of love. And ere I take this charm for her sight, as I can take it with another herb, I'll make her render up her page to me. Hast thou the flower there? Welcome, wanderer! Hi, there it is. I pray thee give it me. I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where onk slips and the nodding violet grows. There sleeps Titania some time of the night, lulled in these flowers with dances and delight, and with the juice of this, I'll streak her eyes and make her full of hateful fantasies. Now look thou meet me ere the first cock crow. Fear not, my lord. Your servant shall do so. Come, now we'll roundle in a fairy song. Sing me now asleep, then to your offices and let me rest. You spotted snakes with double tongue, thorny hedgehogs be not seen. Newts and blind ones do no wrong, come not near our fairy queen. Philomel with melody, sing in our sweet lullaby. Now all is well. One aloof stands sentinel. What thou seest when thou dost wake, do it for thy true love take. Love and languish for his sake. Be it ounce or cat or bear, pard or boar with bristled hair, in thy eye that shall appear when thou wakest, it is thy dear. Wake when some vile thing is near. Are we all met? Pay it, pay it. And here is a marvelous convenient place for our rehearsal. This green plot shall be our stage. This hawthorn break our towering house. And we will do it in action, as we will do it before the Duke. Peter Quince. What sayest thou, bully bottom? There are things in this comedy of Pyramus and Thisbe that will never please. First. Pyramus must draw a sword to kill himself, which the ladies cannot abide. How answer you that? By her luck in a perilous fear. I believe we must leave the killing out. Well, not a whit. I have a device to make all well. Write me a prologue. Let the prologue seem to say we will do no harm with our swords, and that Pyramus is not killed indeed. And, for more better assurance, tell them that I, Pyramus, am not Pyramus, but Bottom the Weaver. This will put him out of fear. Well... We will have such a prologue, and it shall be written in eight 
and six. No, make it two more. Let it be written in eight and eight. Will not the ladies be afraid of the lion? I fear it, I promise you. Masters, you ought to consider with yourselves to bring in, God shield us, a lion among ladies is the most dreadful thing. For there is not a more fearful wild fowl than your lion living, and we ought to look to it. Therefore, another prologue must tell he is not a lion. Nay, you must name his name, and half his face must be seen through the lion's neck. And he himself must speak through, saying thus, or to the same defect, ladies, or fair ladies, I would wish you, or I would request you, or I would entreat you not to fear, not to tremble, my life for yours. If you think I come hither as a lion, it were pity of my life. No, I am not such thing. I am a man as other men are. And there indeed let him name his name and tell them plainly he is Snug the Joiner. Well, it shall be so. But here is two hard things. That is, to bring the moonlight into a chamber. For, you know, Pyramus and Thisbe meet by moonlight. Doth the moon shine the night we play our play? A calendar! A calendar! Look in the almanac! Find out moonshine! Find out moonshine! Yes, it doth shine that night. Why, then you may leave a casement of the great chamber window where we play open and the moon may shine in at the casement. Ah, or else one must come in and with a bush of thorns and a lanthorn and say he comes to disfigure or to present the person of moonshine. Then there's another thing. We must have a wall in the great chamber, for Pyramus and Thisbe says the story did talk through the chink of a wall. You can never bring in a wall. What say you, Bottom? Some man or other must present wall, and let him have some plaster or some loam or some rough cast about him to signify wall, and let him hold his fingers thus, and through the cranny shall Pyramus and Thisbe whisper. If that may be, then all is well. Come. Sit down, every mother's son, and rehearse your part. Pyramus, you begin. When you have spoken your speech, enter into that break, and so everyone according to his cue. What hempen homespuns have we swaggering here, so near the cradle of the fairy queen? What? A, a play toward? <laughs> I'll be an auditor. A an actor, too, perhaps, if I see cause. Speak, Pyramus! This be stand forth. This be thy flowers of odious savor sweet. Odors! 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 Savor sweet. So hath thy breath, my dearest this be dear. But hark, a voice. Stay thou but here a while, and by and by I will to thee appear. A stranger Pyramus than ever played here. Must I speak now? Ah, uh, Mary, must you, for you must understand he goes but to see a noise that he heard and is to come again. Most radiant Pyramus, most lily white of hue, most of color like the red rose on triumphant Breer, most brisky juvenile, e e lo most lovely Jew, as true as truest horse that yet would never tire. I'll meet thee, Pyramus, at Ninny's tomb. Ninny's tomb, man! Why, you must not speak that yet that you answer to Pyramus. You speak all your part at once, cues and all. Pyramus, enter! Your cue is past. It is never tire. Oh. As true as truest horse that yet would never tire. If I were fair, this be, I were only thine. Oh, monstrous! Oh, strange! We are haunted! Pray, masters! Fly, masters! Help! Why do they run away? This is a knavery of them to make me afeard. <sighs> I see their knavery. This is to make an ass of me, to fright me, if they could. But I would not stir from this place, do what they can. I will walk up and down here, and I will sing that they shall hear I am not afraid. Eh, 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 eh. 
the asshole clock's so black of hue with orange tawny bill the throstle with his note so true the wren with little quill what angel wakes me from my flowery bed the finch the sparrow and the lark the playing song cuckoo gray who's no fool many a man doth mark and dares not answer nay <laughs> For indeed, who would set his wit to so foolish a bird? Who would give a bird the lie, though he cry, cuckoo never so? I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Mine ears much enevered of thy note. So is mine eye enthralled to thy shape. And thy fair virtue's force perforce doth move me. On the first view to say, to swear, I love thee. Methinks, mistress, you should have little reason for that, and yet... To say the truth, reason and love keep little company together nowadays. The more the pity that some honest neighbors will not make them friends. Nay! <clears throat> Nay, I can gleek upon occasion. Thou art as wise as thou art beautiful. Oh, not so neither, but if I had wit enough to get out of this wood, I would enough to serve mine own turn. Out of this wood do not desire to go. Thou shalt remain here. Whether thou wilt or no, I am a spirit of no common rate. The summer still doth tend upon my state. And I do love thee. Therefore, go with me. I'll give thee fairies to attend on thee. And they shall fetch the jewels from the deep. And sing while thou on pressed flowers dost sleep. And I will purge thy mortal grossness, so that thou shalt like an airy spirit go. Peas blossom, cobweb, moth, and mustard seed. Ready. And I. And I. And I. Where, where shall, shall we go? go? Be kind and courteous to this gentleman. Hop in his walks and gamble in his eyes. Feed him with apricots and dewberries, with purple grapes, green figs, and mulberries. The honey bags steal from the humble bees, and for the night tapers crop their waxen thighs and light them with the fiery glowworm's eyes. To have my love to bed and to arise, and pluck the wings from the painted butterflies, to fan the moonbeams from his sleeping eyes. Nod to him, elves, and do him courtesies. Hail, mortal. Hail. 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 Oh, <laughs> I cry your worship's mercy heartily. I beseech your worship's name. Cobweb. Oh, I shall desire you of more acquaintance, good master Cobweb. If I cut my finger, I shall make bold with you. Your name, honest gentleman. Peas Blossom. Oh, I pray you, commend me to Mistress Squash, your mother, and to Master Peace Cod, your father. Good Master Peas Blossom, I shall desire you of more acquaintance, too. Your name, I beseech you, sir. Mustard Seed. Oh, good Master Mustard Seed, I know your patience well. That same cowardly, giant like ox beef have devoured many a gentleman of your house. I promise you, your kindred had made my eyes water ere now. I desire your acquaintance more, good Master Mustard Seed. Come, wait upon him, lead him to my bower. The moon, methinks, looks with a watery eye, and when she weeps, every little flower. Lamenting some enforced chastity, tie up my love's tongue, bring him silently. I wonder if Tanya be awaked, then what it was that next came in her eye, which she must dote on in extremity. Here comes my messenger. How now, mad spirit, what night rule now about this haunted grove? My mistress with a monster is in love. <laughs> Near to her close and consecrated bower, while she was in her dull and sleeping hour, a crew of patches. Rude mechanicals that were for bread upon Athenian stalls were met together to rehearse a play intended for great Theseus's nuptial day. <laughs> the shallowest thick skin of the barren sort who Pyramus presented in their sport forsook his scene and entered in a break when I did him at disadvantage take. An ass's knoll I fixed on his head. Anon his thisbe must be answered and forth my mimic comes. When they, when they him spy, as wild geese that the creeping 
fouler eye or russet pated chuffs many in sort, rising and cawing at the gun's report, sever themselves and madly sweep the sky. So, at his sight, away his fellows fly. When in that moment, so it came to pass, to Tanya, Waked and straight away loved an ass. This falls out better than I could devise. I'll to my queen and beg her Indian boy. And then I will her charmed eye release from monster's view. And all things shall be peace. Come. Sit thee down upon this flowery bed while I thy amiable cheeks do coy, and stick musk roses in thy sleek smooth head, and kiss thy fair large ears, my gentle joy. Ah, where's Peas Blossom? Ready. Scratch my head, Peas Blossom. Where's Monsieur Cobweb? Ready. Monsieur Cobweb, good Monsieur, get you your weapons in your hand and kill me a red hip humble bee on the top of a thistle, and good monsieur, bring me the honey bag. Do not fret yourself too much in the action, monsieur. And good monsieur, have a care the honey bag break not. I would loathe to have you overflown with the honey bag, senor. Where's monsieur mustard seed? Ready. Give me your knee, monsieur mustard seed. Pray you, leave your courtesy, good monsieur. What's your will? Nothing good, monsieur, but to help Calvary cobweb to scratch. I must to the barbers, monsieur. Methinks I am marvelous hairy about the face, and I am such a tender ass. If my hair do but tickle me, <laughs> I must scratch. What? Wilt thou hear some music, my sweet love? Oh, I have a reasonable good ear in music. Let's have the tongs and the bones. Or say, sweet love, what thou desires to eat. Mmm, truly a peck of provender. I could munch your good dry oats. Methinks I have a great desire to a bottle of hay. Good hay! <clears throat> Good hay, sweet hay, hath no fellow. I have a venturous fairy that shall seek the squirrel's hoard, and fetch thee new nuts. I had rather have a handful or two of dry peas. Oh, but I pray you, let none of your people stir me. Oh, I have an exposition of sleep come upon me. Oh. Sleep thou. And I will wind thee in my arms. Fairies, be gone, and be always away. So doth the woodbine, the sweet honeysuckle gently entwists. The female ivy so enrings the barky fingers of the elm. Oh, how I love thee, how I dote on thee. Welcome, good Robin. Seest thou this sweet sight? Her dotage now I do begin to pity, for meeting her of late behind the wood, seeking sweet favors from this hateful fool, I did upbraid her and fall out with her, for she his hairy temples had then rounded with a coronet of fresh and fragrant flowers. I then did ask of her her changeling child, which straight she gave me, and her fairy sent to bear him to my bower in fairyland. And now I have the boy. I will undo this hateful imperfection of her eyes. Now, my Titania, wake you, my sweet queen. My Oberon, what visions I have seen. Methought I was enamored of an ass. There lies your love. How came these things to pass? Oh, how mine eyes do loathe his visions now. Silence a while. Robin, take off his head. Come, my queen, take hands with me. Now thou and I are new amity, and will tomorrow midnight solemnly dance in Duke Theseus' house triumphantly. Fairy King, attend and mark. I do hear the morning lark. Uh, 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 when my cue comes, call me. I will answer. My next is most fair Pyramus. I ho, Peter Quint. Flute, the bellows mender, snuff the tinker, starveling! Uh. Oh. God's my life, stolen hints and left me asleep. I have had a most rare vision. I have had a dream. Has the wit of a man to say what dream it was? 
Man is but an ass. If you go about to expound this dream, methought I was. There was no man can tell what. Methought I was, and methought I had. But man is but a patched fool. If you will offer to say what methought I had, the eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen. Man's hand is not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. Ah, uh, I will give Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream. It shall be called Bottom's Dream, because it hath no bottom, and I will sing it in the latter end of a play before the Duke. Peradventure, to make it the more gracious, I shall sing it at her death. Have you sent to Bottom's house? Is he come home yet? He cannot be heard of. Out of doubt, he is transported. If he come not, then the play is marred. It goes not forward, doth it? It is not possible. You have not a man in all Athens able to discharge Pyramus but he. No, he hath simply the best wit of any handicraft man in Athens. Yea, and the best person too. And he is a very paramour for his sweet voice. You must say paragon. A paramour is, God bless us, a thing of naught. Masters, the duke is coming from the temple, and there's two or three lords and ladies more married. If our sport had gone forward, we had all been made men. Oh, sweet bully bottom. Thus hath he lost a sixpence a day during his life. He could not have escaped sixpence a day. And the duke had not given him sixpence a day for playing Pyramus. I'll be hanged. He would have deserved it. Sixpence a day in Pyramus or nothing. Where are these lads? Where are these hearts? Bottom, a most courageous day, a most happy hour. Masters, I am to discourse wonders, but ask me not what, for I, if I tell you, I am no true Athenian. I will tell you everything, right as it fell out. Let us hear, sweet Bottom. Not a word of me. All that I will tell you is that the Duke hath dined. Get your apparel together. Good strings to your beards, new ribbons to your pumps. Meet presently at the palace. Every man look o'er his part, for the short and the long is... Our play is preferred! Gentles, perchance you wonder at this show, but wonder on till truth make all things plain. This man is Pyramus, if you would know. This beauteous lady, Thisbis is certain. This man with lime and rough cast doth present a wall. That vile wall which did these lovers sunder, and through walls chink, poor souls, they are content to whisper. At the which let no man wonder. This man with lanthorn dog and bush of thorn presenteth moonshine. For if you will know, by moonshine did these lovers think no scorn to meet at Nana's tomb. There. There to woo this grisly beast, which lion hot by name, the trusted this becoming first by night, did scare away, or rather did affright. And as she fled her mantle, she did fall, which lion, vile with blood and mouth, did stain. Anon comes Pyramus, sweet youth and tall, and finds his trusty Thisbe's mantle slain. Whereat with blade, with bloody blameful blade, he bravely broached his boiling bloody breast. And Thisbe, tarrying in mulberry shade, his dagger drew and died. For all the rest, let lion, moonshine, wall, and lovers twain at large discourse, while here they do remain. Exeunt prologue, thisbe, lion, and moonshine. Enter power of Pyramus. O oh, grim looked knight, O oh, knight with hues so black, O oh, knight whichever art when day is not, O oh, knight, O oh, knight, alack, 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 I fear my Thisbe's promise is forgot. And thou, O oh wall, O oh sweet, O oh lovely wall, that stands between her father's ground and mine, thou wall, O oh wall, O oh sweet and lovely wall, show me thy chink to blink through with mine eye. 
Wall holds up his fingers. Thanks, courteous Wall. Jove sheath thee well for this. But what see I? No this be do I see. O oh, wicked Wall, through whom I see no bliss, cursed be thy stones for thus deceiving me. Deceiving me! Deceiving me is Thisbe's cue. She is to enter now. I am to spy her through the wall. You shall see it will fall pat as I told you. Yonder she comes. Oh, wall. Full often hast thou heard my moans for parting my fair Pyramus and me. My cherry lips have often kissed thy stones, thy stones with lime and hair knit up in thee. I see a voice. Now will I to the chink, to spy, and I can hear my Thisbe's face. Thisbe! My love thou art, my love, I think. Think what thou wilt, I am thy lover's grace, and like my mander am my trusty still. And I like hell until the fates may kill. Now shall for thus to progress was so true, as shall to progress I to you. Oh, kiss me through the hole of this vile wall. I kiss the wall's hole, not your lips at all. Wilt thou at Ninny's tomb meet me straight away? Tide life, tide death, I come without delay. Thus have I, wall, my part discharged so, and being done, thus wall away doth go. You ladies, you whose gentle hearts do fear the smallest monstrous mouse that creeps on floor may now perchance both quake and tremble here when lion rough and wildest range doth roar. Then know that I, once snug the joiner, am a lion fell, nor else no lion's dam. For if I should, as lion, come in strife into this place, twere pity on my life. This lanthorn doth the horned moon present. Horned present. This lanthorn doth the horned moon present. Myself, the man in the moon, do seem to be. All that I have to say is to tell you that the lanthorn is the moon. I, the man in the moon, this Thorn bush is my thorn bush, and this dog is my dog. This is old Ninny's tomb. Where is my love? Ah! Thisbe runs off. Lion runs off. Sweet moon, I thank thee for thy sunny beams. I thank thee, moon, for shining now so bright. For by the gracious <clears throat> golden glittering gleams. I trust to take of truest this be sight. But stay, <laughs> O oh, spite. But mark, poor knight, what dreadful dole is here. Eyes, do you see? How can it be? O oh, dainty duck, O oh, dear, thy mantle good, what? Stained with blood? Approach, ye furies fell. O oh, fates, come, come. Cut thread and thrum, quail, crush, conclude and quell. Oh, wherefore, nature, didst thou lay in frame? Since lion thou hath here deflowered, my dear, which is no, no. Oh, oh wherefore, nature, didst thou lie in frame? Since lion thou hath here deflowered, my dear. Devoured. Devoured, my dear. Which is, no, no. Which was the fairest dame that lived, that loved, that liked, that looked with cheer. Come, tears confound, outsward and wound, the pap of Pyramus. I that left pap where heart doth hop. Oh! Thus die I, thus, thus, thus. Ooh. Now am I dead, now am I fled, 
My soul is in the sky. Tongue, lose thy light. Moon, take thy flight. Uh. Exit moonshine. Now die, die. Da, da, da. Asleep, my love? What? Dead, my love? Oh, Pyramus, arise! Speak, speak! Quite dumb? Dead, dead? A tomb must cover thy sweet eyes. These my lips, this cherry nose, these yellow cowslip cheeks are gone, are gone. Lovers make moan. Oh. His eyes were green as leeks. O oh, sisters three, come, come to me with hands as pale as milk. Lay them in gore, since you have sure with shears his thread of silk. Tongue, not a word. Come, trusty sword, come blade my breast. Imbue. <laughs> and farewell, friends. Thus this be ends. Adieu, adieu, adieu. No, assure you, the wall is down that parted their fathers. Will it please you to see the epilogue? Or to hear a burgomass dance between two of our company? If we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended, that you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear, and this weak and idle theme no more yielding but a dream. <laughs> oh, gentles, do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend. And as I am an honest puck, if we have unearned luck now to scape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long, else the puck a liar call. So, good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin shall restore amends.